problem is that just like life we have got so many more options in bariatric surgery if you'll actually go to see there are more than 25 to 30 different types of bariatric procedures which have been described and plus now we know that there has been a flood in the market with respect to endoscopic procedures as well and because there is just so much more to choose from it's becoming more and more difficult to decide which procedure is suited for which patient so uh, the problem with this is that, you know, we need to make sure that we don't mismatch a particular patient and a particular procedure. Now, imagine if you get a patient who is not very obese and is actually looking out for a good metabolic result and, you know, you land up doing a weak malabsorptive procedure like a sleeve. The patient may not lose enough weight, may not have the desired metabolic result. Or if you go the other way around, there are high chances that you may cause an excessive weight loss, giving rise to excessive malnutrition in a particular patient as well. So because of this, there are a lot of preoperative factors which need to be considered and even after you've got all your preoperative factors completely sorted out you may always just enter inside the abdomen and get a big surprise and you may have to even change your plan on table now uh, more than 20 years ago nih came out with all their guidelines as to who needs to be offered what kind of therapy for a particular bmi now as dr praveen raj pointed out in his talk earlier that it's not just the bmi that we need to see anymore we need to understand the amount of visceral fat which we come to know on the basis of body composition analysis and along with that see their entire metabolic profile as well but in general the base of any kind of obesity treatment will always always be lifestyle modification Modification. No matter what procedure the patient undergoes, good diet, physical therapy, and a good lifestyle modification will form the basis of every therapy. Now, uh, the in-between range where, you know, uh, there are uh, between the BMI of maybe 25 to 30, that is where we land up having a few experiments in place. So the, these patients may try a bit of pharmacotherapy. You may offer some endoscopic therapies. It's only when they start reaching a BMI of more than 30, 35, 40, that, you know, we know for sure that these patients would do much better with the surgical procedure as compared to any other any other form of treatment. Now, once again, all of these lines are still very blurred. All these criteria range from country to country because every country has got their own cultural influences and uh, every patient will then respond differently. Some cases where it's very clear, like I was saying, is endoscopic procedures. These were clearly invented initially for these super, super rubies where their BMI is more than 60 or 70 kg per meter square. And these patients are those who are unfit for surgery because they're unfit for general anesthesia, where the anesthetist believes that, you know, it will not be safe to keep them under anesthesia for such a long time for a big bariatric procedure. Now, these patients need to be prepared before any surgery. So you may put in an endogastric balloon in these patients and wait for a period of six months or even 12 months in certain cases, get their weight down to a respectable weight where uh, anesthesia can be safely administered. Now, of course, as we have learned more and more from our experiences, we have realized that these endoscopic procedures are also safe for overweight patients, wherein the BMI is somewhere between 25 and 30. And, you know, maybe they don't want to try pharmacotherapy or, you know, they, uh, some people do uh, are very afraid of the adverse effects of many medications. And in these cases, you may try uh, one of the uh, various endoscopic procedures which are available, which would include an intragastric balloon, an endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, and then there are also certain endolamine liners which are available but these are not very popular the most popular of course is the intragastric balloon we've all heard about it we've all seen it being discussed uh, immensely all over uh, since so many years now and off late we also have a swallowable balloon which is available and uh, it's a very good treatment modality but the patient needs to be made aware of the uh, serious side effects which may happen which would include a lot of nausea and vomiting and halitosis in the first couple of weeks at least some patients may not be able to tolerate it and we can't uh, just go in and put in a balloon and then expect the patient to adjust to it later because you cannot compromise the quality of life of these patients. Now, when it comes to bariatric surgery, a surgical procedure out and out, we first of all see the BMI. Now, uh, a disclaimer initially, whenever I'm talking about a BMI in any of my talks, in any of my slides, it's uh, with respect to just uh, the amount of visceral fat which is there. So we are actually looking at targeting obesity as uh, a disease which is uh, you know characterized by an accumulation of excess fat. We are not going to discuss the patients you know who may be slightly overweight or uh, you know just have a higher BMI. BMI because of their muscle mass, etc. 
Now, anybody who has a BMI more than 37.5, irrespective of whether they have any comorbidities, or a BMI of more than 32.5 with at least one obesity-related comorbidity is a good candidate for a bariatric procedure. Now, these are, of course, Indian guidelines and most Asian guidelines. These are different for the Caucasian population. Uh, in, uh, when we discuss uh, comorbidities, the most uh, common one, uh, which we at least see in our country, is type 2 diabetes mellitus because we know that this has a very direct link to obesity. The new term now is diabetes, which is a combination of diabetes and obesity. Along with that, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, dyslipidemia, hypothyroidism, PCOS, and infertility, osteoarthritis, all of these are other comorbidities, which can get a very, very good resolution once the patient undergoes a bariatric procedure. Now, uh, Dr. Barucha has discussed some of the procedures already, which is a sleeve, a RYGB, and a OHGB. Apart from that, there are other procedures as well, like I mentioned. There's a sleeve plus procedure, there's BPDDS, and then there are many other novel experimental procedures which are being done in a few centers over the world. Now, how do we decide which kind of procedure is good for which kind of patient? Obviously, the first thing that we'll end up seeing will be the whole preoperative profile of the patient, the age what their current BMI is, whether they are morbidly obese, whether they are super obese, super, super obese, because the more the weight, the stronger is the malabsorptive metabolic procedure which you need for a particular patient. Now, if the patient also has type 2 diabetes mellitus, we need to see the duration for which they've been suffering because the shorter the duration, the better is the resolution. What medications the patient is taking for diabetes, because the lesser the number of medications, again, better are the chances of resolution. And we can also see that C-peptide and insulin levels, which will give us a good uh, you know, predictive factor as to the amount of resolution of diabetes mellitus that we can expect. There are also other medical diseases which you need to consider like sleep apnea where, you know, the patient's lungs may have to be prepared beforehand. There'll be hypertension. There may be some of them who are uncontrolled hypertensives because all of that needs to be controlled before any kind of surgery. The other factor which we need to consider is the fertility and not just whether the patient is fertile or infertile, but what are their future plans with respect to fertility? Now, because if you get a young woman who wants to lose weight and who is concerned about uh, being able to conceive in the future, we cannot give them a very strong malabsorptive procedure because this may interfere with uh, the child's nutrition whenever the woman gets pregnant. So this is one of the things where, uh, one of the areas where you know we more or less land up offering just a sleeve gastrectomy to this kind of a patient. You also need to know the diet, whether they are predominantly vegetarian or non-vegetarian or both. What kind of lifestyle do they usually follow? We need to do a preoperative endoscopy, check for any evidence of GERD or a hiatus hernia because once you have an abnormal uh, endoscopy or hiatus hernia, an RYGB is definitely the preferred procedure of choice. You have to see the pre-existing nutritional status of the patient, which uh, and if there are any abnormalities, they should be corrected beforehand. And lastly, you need to see the status of the liver, because in cases of cirrhosis or in NASH, again, you don't want to give a malabsorptive procedure, which is going to worsen liver disease. Eventually, why do we see all of these things is to make sure that the outcome that the patient wants and what we want for the patient, they match. We need to see whether you know, the patient is looking out for just an excess weight loss because they have no other comorbidities, whether they're looking out mainly for a metabolic effect. And we also need to assess what their quality of life can be after the procedure. And most importantly, the particular procedure should be safe to perform in that, in that particular patient. So is there a standard set algorithm in bariatric surgery for any particular kind of procedure? Unfortunately, no. This is just a very busy slide, which is what uh, Dr. Palip and I follow in our own practice. And uh, rather than going into details of this, we thought, you know, we'd just give you some more examples of, you know, what all are the basic criteria which we see when we are trying to decide between any of the procedures. Now, the procedures which we offer at our center would be a sleeve, RYGB, an OAGB or MGB, and a sleeve DJB, which is a sleeve plus procedure. And normally the factors which we land up seeing preoperatively, this is once again just a very gross overview of it. Uh, we see the BMI of the patient, whether they are diabetic or any other medical issues, what kind of diet they follow, their age, whether it's a female and if it's a female, then whether she's got any plans for fertility in the future and what their upper GI endoscopy states. 
Now imagine a scenario where the patient's BMI is low, it's less than 40, the patient does not have diabetes, maybe vegetarian, non-vegetarian, either it doesn't matter, but it's a female who wants to have children in the future and her upper GI endoscopy is completely normal. In this case, we would definitely land up offering a sleeve gastrectomy to this patient. Now also sometimes what, we, what may happen is that, you know, if the patient is already more than 40 years of age and has already completed childbearing, but the rest of the profile is similar, we may even offer an RYGB to this kind of a patient. In another scenario, if the patient has got a higher BMI, is diabetic, needs to get rid of the diabetes at all costs, is a hardcore non-vegetarian, which means they eat a meat-based meal uh, all three times of the day for breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, relatively older age, no plans of future fertility and endoscopy is completely normal, we would probably land up offering an MGB to this patient. And we may also just land up offering a sleeve plus procedure depending on how we, uh, you know, uh, whatever we land up discussing with the patient and also patient choice. Similarly, if we find a similar profile, but the patient is a hardcore vegetarian and, you know, there are some Jane patients, we would not really want to offer a very strong malabsorptive procedure like an MGB because we know that MGB can give rise to a lot of iron deficiency anemia, a lot of protein energy malnutrition, and that is going to compromise the quality of life of this patient in the future. So in this kind of a scenario, we would land up offering a sleeve DJB to this patient. Once again, this is all provided the upper GI endoscopy is normal. If for any reason we find that the upper GI endoscopy is abnormal and, you know, the diabetes is, you know, very early onset, the patient is not yet on medications, has got a good chance of resolution, we may land up offering an RYGB as probably a second choice of procedure for this. In all of these scenarios, like I mentioned earlier, if you find an abnormal upper GI endoscopy, if the patient has a hiatus hernia, the first and the only procedure of choice should always, always be an RYGB. Rarely, you may have to do a sleeve and you will have to combine a sleeve with a proper cruroplasty and explain to the patient that, you know, there is still a chance of reflux developing in the future because we know that sleeve is a refluxogenic procedure. And we, again, don't want to compromise the quality of life of any patient. So once again, coming back to the same question, what is the algorithm for the right procedure? And uh, the thing is, this has been studied worldwide. There are multiple reviews, multiple meta-analysis based on this, but... Uh, there was a paper which was printed back in 2002 and even 20 years later, the conclusion of this paper still stands true. First and foremost, there is no gold standard bariatric procedure. You cannot say that this one particular procedure will work for every particular kind of patient. There is, it has to be customized always. And because there is no one particular procedure which is apt for everyone, every bariatric surgeon who's entering into bariatric practice needs to know how to perform more than one particular type of bariatric surgery. And also they should be aware of the possible complications and how to follow up in every particular case. Lastly, any patient can be broadly matched to any operation. From the few examples that I gave you earlier, you can see that I've always given two choices for, for each and every scenario because there is always a choice which is available to us. And that is what makes this field a little more complex, but at the same time, a little more interesting. So uh, to conclude, please do not have a fixed mindset that you will be a sleeve surgeon or you will be a bypass surgeon because it doesn't work that way. You have to be able to perform at least three or four different types of bariatric procedures. And also you should be able to perform your own upper GI endoscopies. That is when uh, you, know, you can offer the entire array to every patient and actually do good justice to every patient. Explain to every patient beforehand that suddenly on table, you may have a change in your decision. If sometimes uh, with very super obese patients with a BMI of more than 50, 60, 70, there is so much of thickness in the abdominal wall that it's just impossible for you to perform a bypass. As Dr. Praveen mentioned earlier, you know, there is also a shortening of the mesentery. What if you're not able to pull up a bowel loop up in order to get an enough, uh, in order to perform an RYGB? In that case, you may have to land up doing a sleeve as a first stage procedure. And that is why, because you, why only once you go in and you feel all the tissues with your own hand that you can make out uh, that, uh, you know, this whatever a bypass may not be completely appropriate always. Now, irrespective of whatever procedure is chosen, please always stress on the importance of a healthy diet and a regular exercise regime in all cases. A bariatric procedure will always help the patient to lose weight, but maintaining all that lost weight can only be done with a good lifestyle and that has to be taught to the patient pre-operatively in your counseling sessions, whether it's done by you, your psychologist or any other counselor or any other therapist in your team, but it has to be done. 
and whenever you're doing a preoperative workup make sure that you're including every system in your body so head to toe practically everything needs to be examined completely thoroughly and once the patient has undergone surgery please stress on the importance of follow up and keep holding regular support group meetings so that the procedure works for them very well they understand how to manage themselves after every procedure they understand the importance of nutritional supplements after the procedure and they can all all the patients can meet each other and fig, help uh, you know help each other figure out what exactly is the best way forward thank you